Hey everyone, today we're going to be learning about momentum. What is momentum? Well, it's kind of like the amount of motion in an object. There are four animations playing on the screen, and each of them demonstrates the effects of momentum. In the top left-hand corner, you can see two hockey players colliding, and it turns out that the momentum in each of their bodies before the collision can actually determine how much velocity they're going to have after the collision. Similarly, in the bottom right-hand corner, there's a billiards table where someone provides momentum to the white cue ball. And when that cue ball strikes the other billiard balls, it transfers its momentum into them. So they start moving as a result. In the bottom left-hand corner, there's a cannon firing an artillery shell with a high velocity. As a result of firing the artillery shell, the cannon actually goes backwards. Pretty interesting. And in the top right-hand corner, just like the cannon, someone's taking a hatchet to a bottle of Axe body spray, uh, and the two sides of the bottle are actually going in different directions. One of them, you might notice, moves a little bit faster than the other, and there's probably a reason for that. Maybe when you get to the end of this video, you can come back and figure out why that happens. So what is momentum? Rather than providing a textbook definition, I'm gonna give you two ways to think about it. Momentum is how much oomph an object is carrying as it moves. Now, just intrinsically, you can know kind of what I'm talking about here. If someone throws a very light object and you catch it, you're not going to feel a whole lot of oomph. But if someone tosses a really heavy object at you and you catch that, you feel a lot of oomph. So think about that feeling you get in your body when you catch something heavy and you'll know exactly what momentum is. The second thing I want you to consider is that momentum is something that can be transferred from one object to another. That kind of matches with the idea we were just talking about. So with these two thoughts in mind, let's see momentum play out in two scenarios, and then I think we'll have a pretty good understanding of how it works and what kind of variables go into determining how much momentum an object has. Here's scenario number one. Imagine that you're on a road and you're standing right in the middle and you see two cars barreling down the road straight at you. You wanna get out of the way of those cars to live another day. And you need to know a couple things about those cars in order to make an informed decision about which way you're going to dart very quickly to sustain the least possible amount of damage. So looking at these two cars, they look like they're about the same make and model. So let's assume they have the same mass. But using your imaginary speed gun that you point at each car, you're able to determine that the red car is traveling at 50 miles per hour and the blue car is traveling at 70 miles per hour. And in case you're curious in metric units, that would be approximately 22 meters per second and approximately 31 meters per second. So the question is, which of these two cars should you avoid? Which one should you dart away from and risk getting hit by the other car so that you can receive a little less damage? Let's assume you know you're going to be hit by one and you're just trying to minimize the injuries you sustain. So which one do you avoid? Well, the blue car is a little bit further back, but it's traveling faster. So let's just assume that they're going to hit you at the exact same moment and time isn't a factor. That being the case, it should be pretty obvious that it's the faster car that you should avoid. And the reason ends up being it has more momentum. And when it hits you, it can transfer more momentum into your body than the other car. So more speed seems to suggest more momentum. Let's look at scenario two. Imagine you're at a backyard barbecue and you're seeing a bunch of family members that you haven't seen for a while. Your little cousin Jimmy, who's maybe 10 years old, sees you and runs over because you're their favorite aunt or uncle or whatever. And you remember as you're leaning down for a hug that little Jimmy has 40 kilograms of mass to him because you're weird and you've memorized all the masses of your family members. Uh, and then let's say while you're waiting for Jimmy to hug you, creepy Uncle Todd starts running at you too. And of course you've memorized that creepy Uncle Todd has a mass of 80 kilograms. Now let's assume that they're traveling with the same velocity in your direction and they're gonna reach you at the exact same moment. Which one should you avoid? Well, there's probably a few reasons that you'd wanna avoid Creepy Uncle Todd, but in this case, scientifically, it's because Creepy Uncle Todd will have more momentum and you might sustain more injuries with Creepy Uncle Todd knocking into you than little cousin Jimmy. So more mass seems to suggest more momentum. So let's put together these two ideas we just discussed to figure out what determines how much momentum is in an object. Momentum is gonna be symbolized with the letter P, and P turns out to be equal to M times V, mass times velocity. So now we can see from those scenarios why having more mass or more velocity means you have more momentum. Here's a quick example of how you would calculate how much momentum is in an object. Let's say you kick a two kilogram football at a velocity of 30 meters per second. 
Let's calculate the momentum. Momentum would equal two kilograms of mass multiplied by 30 meters per second of velocity. Multiplying two by 30 gives you 60. And when the units combine, you end up with kilograms times meters divided by seconds. Now, sometimes in physics, a bunch of units put together can be crushed into just one new letter that we give a new name for units. But in this case, momentum actually has a big ugly unit where we just smush the units together and call it a day. So momentum's unit is the kilogram meter per second. Now this formula is very powerful. It can allow you to do things like predict the future and even look into the past. So let's see what kind of interactions in our universe are based on momentum so that we can use this formula to do cool stuff. Well, there's two types of momentum interactions and I've got a little asterisk next to that too because technically there's three. And they are collisions and explosions. The third is gonna be just a second type of collision. So collisions are defined as any time two objects come together and make contact. So there's a collision and there's a collision. I just showed you the two different types of collisions, in fact. Uh, the first is elastic collisions, where things bounce apart after they collide. And the second is inelastic collisions, where things stick together and remain as one object after they collide. The third type of interaction is called an explosion which is anytime two attached objects come apart from one another. Here are some animations to help you visualize these three types of interactions. First, an elastic collision. These two people run at each other, they bounce apart, and then one person just totally eats it as a result. This is brutal, it's like one of my favorite gifts though. Boom, there she blows. Inelastic collisions, on the other hand, as opposed to bouncing apart, are when things stick together after they collide. So you see two football players coming together and smush, they become one object and they fall straight to the ground. And lastly, explosions. You might expect a lot of flames and fire here, but actually an explosion is just any time one object becomes two or more than two objects. In this case, Captain America and his shield are kind of like one object until he throws it forward and now they are two objects. So that counts as an explosion. The fiery balls of death that you think of when you hear the word explosion, of course, are also explosions. They're just more dramatic examples. So now that we know the two or technically three types of interactions that we're going to see that momentum can help us to understand, let's learn about how momentum behaves in these interactions. That's going to lead us to the law of conservation of momentum. The law of conservation of momentum is very similar to the other conservation laws that you've already learned in physics, like the law of conservation of energy and of matter. A conservation law basically says that all the stuff that exists before your observation is equal to all the stuff that exists after your observation. So in this case, the thing we observe is gonna be a collision or an explosion. Here's a long way of explaining the law of conservation of momentum, and I'll follow it up with a short way. When two objects collide or explode, their combined momentum before the event will always be equal to their combined momentum after the event. This is a long way of saying the total momentum in a system before the event will always be equal to the total momentum in a system after the event. So now that we've gone over what this law says, let's see in action. Here's an animation showing a collision of two objects. And specifically, this is an elastic collision because the objects bounce apart rather than sticking together. The law of conservation of momentum says that all the momentum in the system before they smack together should still be equal to all the momentum in the system after they smack together. In order to find out how much momentum there is in this system, we have to do a calculation, actually two technically, and then we're gonna put those answers together. We need the momentum of object one, which is the three kilogram block, and we need the momentum of object two, which is the one kilogram block. And we're gonna look at all the numbers before the collision. So here's what the math would look like. The total momentum in that whole system of objects is equal to the momentum of object one, plus the momentum of object two. Each of those momentums can be calculated with mass times velocity. If you plug the numbers in, you get three kilograms times eight meters per second for the first block, and then one kilogram times four meters per second for the second block. You crunch those numbers and you get 24 plus four, or a total of 28 kilogram meters per second in the whole system before they collide. Let's now look at the numbers after the collision. We can see that the masses stay the same, but the velocities change. So what would the math look like afterward? Well, the only thing that changes is the velocities. So all the same work being done out for the after scenario, uh, we get three kilograms times six meters per second for object one, 
in one kilogram times 10 meters per second for the second block, which gives us 18 plus 10 or 28 kilogram meters per second. So whether you look at all the numbers and put them together before they collide, or you look at all the numbers and put them together after they collide, you still get 28 kilogram meters per second in the whole system, regardless of before or after where you're looking. So you could say that momentum of the system was conserved. It stayed the same. Now, momentum might have transferred from one object to the other. You can actually see that object number one slows down, whereas object number two speeds up. So that means object one gave momentum to object two. It transferred its momentum into another object. Um, but the total in the whole system stayed the same. So that was a collision. Here's the same idea, but with an explosion example. There's two objects now sitting in the center of the frame uh, and they explode apart. And you can see that their velocities are different after they explode. And that's because their masses are different. This is kind of like the Axe body spray example from the first slide. So let's do the same numerical analysis that we did for the first problem. Same thing as before. The total momentum in the system will be equal to the momentum of object one plus the momentum of object two. Break momentum into mass times velocity for both of them, and we have enough information to plug in values. The mass of the first block is five kilograms, and it starts out not moving, which means its initial velocity is zero meters per second. The other block similarly starts out at zero meters per second. So regardless of the masses of either of these, you know that the total momentum in the whole system starts out as zero because nothing is moving. There's no motion at all here. So that's the before scenario. What about after when they are moving? Well, things get a little bit interesting because now we have an object moving to the left and an object moving to the right. Those directions oppose one another and we have to account for that in the math. So you'll see at the bottom there, the masses are still the same in our second calculation, but the velocities have changed. So instead of zeros, now we have negative 15 meters per second being plugged in for the velocity of object one and positive 25 being plugged in for the velocity of object two. So why the negative on the 15? Well, in physics, we have to determine what directions we're gonna call positive and what directions we're gonna call negative. Typically, moving to the right means positive and moving to the left means negative. There's no particular reason for that. It could be the other way around, but physicists just like to all be on the same page about directions. Similarly, up is usually positive and down is usually negative. So when you put all these numbers together, five times negative 15 ends up equaling negative 75 and three times positive 25 equals positive 75. So you put the negative 75 and the positive 75 together, and guess what? You still get zero kilogram meters per second of momentum in this system. So even though stuff is moving, you can still technically say there is no momentum in total because all the momentum in object two is canceled out by all the momentum in object one. So that's the law of conservation of momentum in action. And you can always rely on this law to be true in our universe which is why it's very useful for people like police officers or investigators who need to find out who's responsible in a car crash or where a bullet was fired from after you find the landing place of the bullet. Really interesting things can be done with momentum if you understand how these collisions and explosions work. So I'm excited to see what you guys can do with this unit. That's all for today. I'll see you in the next video.